Okay. Um, <coughs> just another note about this uh, list of approved exercises. Uh, I will be updating it now and then. Like uh, I updated it. Oh, I thought I put up a new version. Um, I didn't change this here. But uh, I, I need to, um, yeah, this was actually changed this morning, so I have to make sure I have the right one up here. So if uh, I will be putting the latest one up, like as I get more uh, homeworks in, it may not come up immediately. But if over a long period of time you see that you've delivered something and you don't see an OK next to your name, then you should let me know. Because it means I've missed your, I haven't seen your email or something. So I need to just check my email system because I get, like with each exercise, I get like 100 messages. So I have to know th that um, there can be some uh, missing ones that maybe I haven't seen in my emails. So if you see anything that uh, should be approved and it's not there, let me know. And eventually, uh, if you don't have three approved exercises, I will not deliver your name to take the exam. So you need to deliver the exercises in order to take the exam. I will give a list at the end of the, le of the lecture period. Uh, so in the last lecture, I will give a list to the study administration and they will say that the people on this list can take the exam. So today we are talking about uh, chapter 5. And I have not changed the notes since the last, um, since the ones that I have. So these are from, I think, version 3 of the book. But they will suffice to cover what we're talking about uh, in version 6 of the book. So chapter 5 is about estimating projects, the times and costs. And um, <coughs> Uh, first of all, it's um, it's a process that's necessary because you want to be able to say that at the end of the project you're fulfilling the stakeholders' expectations and their needs. And in order to do this, you have to make sure that you have correctly estimated the expectations and the needs of the stakeholders. And um, and you can use this also in checking whether or not you've implemented things on time and in budget. There's two types of estimates that can be used. One is called a top-down approach, which is a macro approach. And the other is called bottom-up. And uh, the top-down approach comes from top management and is based on the estimates of analogy, group consensus, and mathematical relationships. And then the bottom-up approach is using estimates from line managers or those that are working with the project and it's based on the work breakdown structure. <coughs> OK, so why do you want to have uh, these estimates? Um, I don't have my pointer. OK, so you, you, you need the estimates because it, it supports uh, good decisions. It supports the, uh, it's needed to schedule work to determine how long the project should take and its cost to determine whether the project is worth doing, to develop cash flows, to determine how well the project is progressing, and the needs to develop a time phase budget that is associated with the project. Okay. So different uh, points that they make in the book, and that is that um, <coughs> when you're, you're estimating the cost and the times of, of the project, you should try to be as accurate as possible because this will help you later on uh, when you're evaluating the project and when you're uh, trying to meet the customer's needs. And things that you should not do is you should not try, you should not be padding the estimates because this will, um, <coughs> this will like overestimate how much it costs to do something. And uh, then this isn't a realistic estimation of the system. And um, 
if you are looking at the project structure and organization, uh, this has to do with whether or not you're using a matrix uh, type structure or whether you're using dedicated teams. And this will uh, have different implications on the, on the estimates of the cost of the project. So you need to take into consideration all of these in your estimates. Um, <coughs> normally when um, they're making estimates, <coughs> uh, they take into consideration that um, you should ask the people that are most familiar with the tasks to make the estimates. These are all recommendations. You should use uh, several people to make the estimates, not just like one group. Uh, so um, uh, you should use uh, normal conditions when you're making the estimates and not to use like special conditions. So uh, this is basing on experience. This is basing it on group decisions, not just individual decisions, and normal conditions. And then uh, you should be uh, use consistent time units. So if you are measuring things in terms of the work month, you need to do this on all of the uh, points in the work breakdown structure. So you use that as the base time unit across the whole project. If you're using minutes, uh, then you use minutes across the whole project, but you have to use a consistent time unit. And then you should uh, treat each activity as independent, so you don't, uh, when you know <coughs> an activity is going to take a certain amount of time, a certain cost, you should not uh, have it contingent on another activity being done and try to and blend these things together. So you have, the, uh, you have an estimate that's based on independent tasks within the, sis within the system. And then you don't make allowances for contingencies, meaning that um, uh, one thing depends on another thing. Instead, you would look at something like a risk analysis, and that's uh, discussed in uh, chapter 7. So it's a different chapter when they talk about that. But you should not allow for contingencies. <coughs> so these are different points that are made in pages 131 to 133. And basically, so again, the responsibility is the first one. And that is uh, making the people that are most familiar with the task responsible. Uh, use of several people in the estimate so that they can have group consensus. <coughs> using normal conditions. Using consistent time units. Estimate things independently. Uh, do not work in uh, contingencies, so the work package estimates should not include allowances for contingencies. And then adding a risk assessment uh, to estimate the um, helps avoid to surprise stakeholders. So that's actually, I don't know if they, yeah, that was there. So you should add a risk assessment to avoid surprises for stakeholders. Okay. So uh, well, in terms of the two systems, the top-down versus the bottom-up system, uh, there's different conditions that, would, uh, that we would prefer to do, use one system versus the other. So when you have a macro or a top-down system, you're doing it because you need to have a strategic, strategic decision-making. You have high uncertainty. You have a an internal or small project, and you have unstable scope. And when you have bottom up, you have um, cost and time that's important, fixed price contract, and the customer wants details. But in, in truth, you usually have um, a need to do both top down and a bottom up approach. So it's not that you're using one in exclusion of the other. So in in actuality, you're using um, uh, both systems. You make a rough top-down estimate, 
and then you develop a work breakdown structure and organization breakdown structure and then you make a bottom-up estimates and then you develop schedules and budgets based on the bottom-up estimates so the the output of the top-down uh, so estimates is the work breakdown structure and the organization breakdown structure and then the output of the uh, the top, the bottom-up estimates is the schedules and the budgets. And then you try to reconcile the differences between the two estimates to make them uh, be more or less uh, the same types of estimates. Uh, so there's different approaches for uh, doing this, um, the top-down approach. There's a consensus method. And the one method that they mention in the book on pages 135 and 136 is the Delphi method. And the Delphi method is like a, a method where you interview, they could be managers or experts that have to do with uh, the project. And you, uh, and you let them uh, make a um, sort of a ranking on the types of uh, times and costs that are associated with the activities of the project. And then the, the, you take a, a survey of all of these, and you see how it ranks across the, the company. And then after one cycle, you, you show this ranking. And then you ask them to do it again. And then as, as you do it, there should be more consensus over the um, period that there's less um, there's just uh, less deviation about what is more important or less important, and, and there's more consensus about the times and the cost over, over several cycles of this. Uh, but basically, it's a group method where you're asking the experts to give their opinion, their subjective views, and after a while, there's a consensus based on the group's decision. Um, and then the ratio method is described on page 136 and that is for example they talk about um, if you have uh, cost per square feet uh, this would be like a ratio for like building a house you might have a house that's 2700 square feet and costs 160 uh, per square foot and then they estimate how much it would cost to make the house based on these ratio units. Uh, the upper proportion method is uh, described on page 137 and also there's a picture of that in um, figure 5.1 on page 137 and this is based on historical cost figures. Uh, so I believe that is it's here and you can see that maybe they had former projects that estimated the, pro the amount of cost in each of these particular areas in the work breakdown structure and then they they consider this as a proportion or percentage of the costs in each of the areas so it says for example the foundation might represent three percent of the total loan Framing 25%, electric plumbing 15%, etc. Payments are made as these items are completed. An analogous process is used by some companies that proportion costs to deliverables in the work breakdown structure. So they associate the, um, the cost with each of the deliverables that are broken down according to percentage in this structure. Okay. Uh, the next uh, method is a uh, function point methods for software and systems projects. And an example of that is given in tables 5.2 and 5.3 on page 138. Let me just go to that. So this is an example of uh, you would have the number of inputs or the number of outputs uh, in a particular, say you were creating a software program then you would put in the number of inputs that you would have to do and the number of outputs and the number of inquiries and number of files and interfaces. And uh, whether or not this is of low complexity, average complexity, or high complexity, you would fill it in. And then you would figure out the number of uh, points in the point counting process. And the idea is basically 
as uh, you get um, uh, you're estimating the labor costs based on the number of actions and then the number of actions are functional points in the system and that uh, you have um, uh, you also have historical data on what is the cost per point for example so say you have something that is going to be five points and then you know historically that is going to cost you in terms of labor like 20,000 or something like that so you're trying to figure out what is going to be your labor cost based on the size of the project and you're estimating the size of the project or the complexity of the project based on these number of points so this is just um, a way to kind of quantify the size and complexity of the project and, and associate that with, with historical data on labor costs. So this is the number of points. And then uh, in this case, they have uh, figured out that um, uh, the number of 15 points on inputs and it has a complexity rating of 2. And then it has uh, five points on outputs and a complexity rating of six. And so then it multiplies this out to get the total size of the project in terms of points. And what this means, this 660 doesn't mean anything in particular. But if they have like some historical data on the cost associated with different point ranges, then they know approximately how much that is going to cost them. Okay. So these are all um, kind of quick ways. Well, they may not be so quick, but these are the ways that top management would try to make general estimates of times and costs. So they can use an ag agreement method that they do in groups based on experts making their subjective opinions. They can use some sort of ratio methods or a proportion methods. And then they can also use this functional point method. And then there's uh, learning curves which there's no, um, uh, there's no figure for this. But if you look in the appendix, there's a appendix 5.1 on page 155. There are, <coughs> here's an example of uh, a learning curve. And the learning curve means that as you do things in, in, in the number of times, you get better at doing it. And maybe it costs you less to do it the next time. So this is uh, learning curves. And then on page 155, there's a table that looks like, I can try to draw this up here, as units. And then it has labor hours and it has like one two four eight and sixteen and to do one it might cost to eight hundred points um times one and that equals eight hundred labor or points labor hours and then the, for to do it at two units, it may then they learn something, and um, oh, they learn something, so uh, they do it a little bit more efficiently. So maybe at it, uh, at a learning curve of of uh, point eighty percent. Uh, so um, oh, sorry, this is eight hundred. So they do 800 points, and then they have a learning curve. And then this becomes 640. So to do two units, it costs them uh, less labor hours uh, per unit than to do, it, to do one unit, because they've learned something in the process of doing that. And then they have this going down. Also, they have 640 times 0.80. And that equals 512. And then 512 times 0 0.8 is 410. And then 410 times 0 0.8 is 328. So 
so it and they end up doing are becoming more efficient at uh, producing the same things. Okay. Okay. So then um, you have different types of uh, bottom-up approaches. And the bottom-up approaches are the template method, and that is discussed on page 139. So the template method uses past projects as, um, um, so you know the known cost on certain tasks. So, um, so they are talking about the ship uh, dry a ship repair dry dock firm has a template for overhaul electrical and mechanical uh, operations, and that they would refer to this database of costs on particular activities. So they would use a so they said well to do electricity installation it cost us uh, five hundred kroners or something like that. I don't know, but uh, they, they just look at the, in their database what it usually costs for a particular activity. <coughs> and then uh, the next thing is the param par par paramedic procedure uh, is applied to specific tasks. And this is also, in some ways, it's, con it's comparable to the ratio method in that uh, you would have um, let's see. Uh, this one is like um, they're talking about say you need you have 36 uh, different computer workstations and you need to convert them and you have uh, three people to work on them and then how many days is it going to take you to do this so you have uh, 36 divided by 3 is uh, <coughs> 12 and then you have, if you, or you have, to, uh, if it takes three days, um, uh, let me see, it says 36 workstations would take three technicians four days to work on. Um, I think it would take three days. For three workstations per day, so if you have 36 workstations divided by three technicians, you get 12 per day. And then 36 workstations divided by 12 per day is three days. So it would actually take you three days to do that. But you use these parameters to determine how much uh, resources you have to apply to a specific task. Okay. And then there's the uh, detailed estimate for the work breakdown structure work package and you might have a um, range of activities or range for estimating the cost and that's uh, here so we have um, <coughs> we have something that's um, you have a detailed estimate of the work breakdown structure work packages we might have a work packages that are uh, engineering, project management, property acceptance, base maps. And then you have the estimate in terms of uh, low, average, and high estimate for each of these, and based on several estimates. And uh, this can also be, uh, this is sometimes called a PERT method, and it's described on page 140. So um, how, uh, it says, when work packages have significantly an uncertainty with the time or cost to complete, it is prudent policy to require the three estimates, low, average, and high, borrowed from the PERT methodology that uses probability distributions. So this is coming up with uh, three estimates in terms of uh, the, what's the lowest it could cost, what's the average it would cost, and what's the highest it would cost in terms of the number of days it takes to do something.
And then there's uh, a hybrid estimating uh, uh, method. And the hybrid estimating method does, um, it estimates the current phase in a lot of detail. And then it uh, estimates the future phases in the less detail. So those are, um, um, yeah. So we have, if you're at the present uh, phase, say if, uh, if this is the present phase, then you have a lot of detail maybe going down to the work breakdown structure. And then uh, you use the macro methods to estimate the future phases. And then when you get to the next phase, then you do it in detail. And then you use the macro estimates for the future phases. Okay. So even though at the beginning of the chapter they say that you should have as much uh, detail as possible. Uh, there's uh, always going to be a balance in terms of how much detail uh, can you have. And it says that uh, the level of detail in the work breakdown structure varies with the complexity of the proce project. Uh, excessive detail is costly because you need a lot of uh, information to get this detail. And it can create a lot of paperwork. But insufficient detail will be costly because it means you don't have enough uh, information to, uh, to um, you're not focused on the goals, and maybe you're doing a lot of wasted activities. Uh, they have some uh, examples of projects in the, in the book. And one of the snapshots is from the Council of Fumes as the tram tail unfolds. And this is an example of a project where they uh, hugely underestimated the cost for doing something. And then they were not able to implement it because they had uh, underestimated the actual, the actual cost. So that was a, a case of not getting enough uh, details. <coughs> These are not uh, discussed in the present uh, book, so these two slides we will just uh, not talk about. Okay, so these are things that are not, these two slides are not included. Uh, but what the book does uh, talk about, and you probably should look at it, I think it's in both of version five and six, is figure 5.4 on page 143 is the top down and the bottom up estimates. So this figure kind of summarizes all of these different estimates that we mentioned. It has um, the intended use um, of, the, of the estimates is uh, for feasibility phases, uh, rough time costs, fund requirements, and resource capability planning. Um, and the methods that are used are a consensus ratio, a proportion, uh, function point and learning curves. And then the bottom up methods are used for budgeting, scheduling, resource requirements, and funding, fund timing. And then uh, the methods are template, parametric, uh, WBS packages, and range estimates. Okay, let me just. Um, the types of costs that are included in these cost estimates are direct cost and, in, and overhead costs, or sometimes they're called indirect costs, and then also general administrative overhead costs. I think the main difference between these are the direct costs have to do with labor materials and equipment that are used in the project. Uh, the uh, uh, indirect or the overhead costs have to do with uh, different uh, costs that are have to do with the project, but might be like the overhead, like the vacation time on the salaries, for example, or renting spaces or supplies and machinery uh, that maybe are not directly tied to the deliverable, but also but uh, that do support the project work. So maybe like the vacation costs on the on the um, people that are working on the project, for example. And then you have the general administrative and overhead costs. And these might have to do with 
organization costs that pertain to the organization that's running the project, but not directly related to the project itself. So it could be the cost of um, some, the organization charges for senior management's uh, involvement, or for advertising, or for setting up an accounting or a cost structure within the organization. So there may be different overhead costs for the organization. And sometimes when some, if you're applying for um, uh, projects, they may just break this, they may put these two together and say that these overhead costs are indirect costs and that these costs are direct costs. So it depends on the description of the package of, or of the project. Okay, so the um, refining estimates are discussed on page 146. And the, the reasons for adjusting estimates is the interaction costs are hidden uh, in the estimates because the tasks normally when you're defining them should be defined as independent tasks. And so that you don't necessarily see the interaction costs. Um, the normal conditions do not apply. They gave an example of maybe you have three bulldozers that turn up to the work site instead of four bulldozers, and so you have less uh, resources available, and that these are not normal conditions. Uh, then things go wrong. You might have design flaws with the technology. There may be accidents. And these are not accounted for in the original project cost estimates. You might have changes in the project scope and plans. So you have the customers themselves might define uh, different things that they want at the end of the project than they had at the beginning. And then the people that are involved in the project have to think about uh, how much scope creep can they allow for and what changes are acceptable within the original plan and what are not acceptable. Uh, if we try to increase the scope of the project, it usually means it's going to cost more. And do we allow um, the costs to go up? Or do we reduce the quality? Or do we take more time? So you have to think about what are your options there. And the idea with this is that even though you make a lot of good plans about estimating costs, you might actually have to adjust these estimates. And these are reasons why you might have to adjust the estimates, because things happen when you actually are in the implementation of the project. And then adjusting the estimates, you have time and cost estimates that are specific activities um, that are adjusted as risk, resources, and situations. Um, the, these, that means that um, over time, uh, things happen, and you have to see what happens in the project over time, and then you make adjustments. Uh, other things that they talk about that could influence uh, the changing, like not estimating correctly, and then having to change your estimates, are things like uh, maybe you were too overly optimistic at the beginning of the project, and you thought you could do more work within certain cost uh, than you actually could do, so that uh, these estimates were incorrect, actually. And then there may have been a strategic misrepresentation, which means that uh, maybe some of the costs were purposely underestimated because uh, certain people wanted to get the project approved. But then it wasn't actually a um, realistic estimate of the cost. And this is what happened in terms of the case study on page 135. Uh, where they they underestimated the cost of getting it done just so they could get it approved. And then when they actually did it, they the realization was it costs more. And then they said, well, then, then everybody is angry because they said, we can't actually do this within the estimated cost. So doing things like <coughs> misrepresenting the costs or, or uh, uh, not to, uh, or being overly optimistic or not necessarily good they're not good things for um, the project if it means that you have to adjust your your, your estimates greatly uh, then they talk about um, contingency funds and uh, time buffers these issues are, are basically discussed 
uh, more in chapter 7. So we won't uh, cover this here, but uh, basically uh, there are different ways to offset the uncertainty and um, um, it's a way to be able to actually complete the project based on the, the estimates. And then, um, so this, this will be covered more in chapter seven. And then in um, the end, they have that um, some people might use uh, databases for estimating uh, costs. And this is what was talked about in using the templates. And the idea is that if you create a database, uh, like a company might do a lot of projects, and they know that certain activities cost to a certain amount of money for each uh, project that they've done, they put this information into the database. And then with each successive project, uh, they get better estimates and better, um, they, they become more accurate with each uh, successive project. So they can, um, um, they can, they, they talked about like on page 148, there's an example. At least it's in the new book. There's a uh, research highlight mega projects a special case and it talks about the big companies saving their data in a database and using a system that's called reference class forecasting methodology Which page? on page 148 <coughs> I don't know if it's in uh, version 5 but it's in version 6 and it talks about uh, the reference class forecasting methodology is you select a reference class project similar to your potential project as a, for example, a cargo ship or a bridges. And then you collect a range of outcome data as distributed, uh, create the distribution of costs, overruns, as a percentage of the original project estimates. And you have low and high cost estimates. And then you use the distribution data to arrive at realistic forecasts. And so you're using this information from former projects to help you to estimate uh, the cost in future projects. And it says uh, the benefits are that outside empirical data mitigates human bias. Um, it avoids like some political issues. It serves as a reality check for funding of large projects. Uh, it helps avoid unsound optimism, which was listed as one of the problems. And it uh, leads to improved accountability and provides a basis for contingency funds. So um, this addresses, well, it addresses some of the reasons for adjusting estimates, which is like uh, being overly optimistic. So that's uh, basically it for, this for, for today and this chapter. So just be aware of the different approaches, top-down and bottom-up approaches. <coughs>